All right. Photosynthesis, the process of autotrophs, or producers like grass, trees, converting carbon dioxide and water into glucose, sugar. Question is, are these five things on the screen, which one of these are made through photosynthesis, at least somehow? Think about that. Well, obviously, wood, plants are made from photosynthesis. That should be obvious. On the bottom right, we got paper. Paper's made from trees, so yeah, paper as well. How about the rabbit? Is he made through photosynthesis? Well, kind of. He does not use photosynthesis himself, but that little grass that's underneath his paws, he eats that grass, which gets its energy and the carbon through photosynthesis. So yes, the rabbit was made through photosynthesis. Oil. Is oil made through photosynthesis? Yes, it is. Little tiny plants and animals take in carbon from the atmosphere, from the air, and if they get buried under the ground and get cooked, boom, you get oil. The only one on this list that is not made through photosynthesis is Mr. Rock. Now, rocks are not made through photosynthesis, but everything else here is. Wood is just a bunch of carbon. It used to be in the air, but the tree took it out of the air and stored it within its tissues, making wood, which then can make paper or oil or even can sometime turn, in, turn into a rabbit. All right. All right, energy. The three letters you definitely need to know, A-T-P. A-T-P. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And that is the molecule that can be used right now as an immediate source of energy. Well, what is energy? Energy is the ability to do work. So as you're writing with your pencil right now or looking with your eyes or thinking with your brain, all that is work. And you need energy to do all that stuff. Yes, all right, so why do cells need energy? Obviously, when you move, transport substances across the cell membrane. I don't know if you remember from three, four weeks ago, but active transport requires ATP energy when you pump things from low concentration to high concentration. Uh, breaking down and also building new molecules. Basically, everything you do requires energy, so you need ATP. All right, so how do we get our ATP? Well, you think, well, we just eat ATP. No, nah. ATP's way over here. We don't eat it. First, we eat some stuff, which you probably know. It's called food. Boop, boop, boop. It'd be a lot of things. Tortilla chips, apple, bread, ice cream, whatever that is. Well, that food, they're complex. They're like fats. Some are carbohydrates. Some are sugars. But our body first needs to break it down into Mr. Simple Glucose. And we remember its formula, C6H12O6. Well, once we got into this one simple sugar molecule, then the mitochondria in our cells can convert that glucose, boom, into Mr. ATP. Now, when you got this guy, now you can use it as an immediate source of energy. Glucose is good. It can be converted into energy, but it is not ready to be used immediately as energy. It first needs to be converted into Mr. ATP. All right, so how does ATP or adenosine triphosphate work? Well, first thing you know, it's made up of basically four parts. You got a molecule called adenosine, which is uh, it's a molecule in a lot of things. It's in your DNA. It could be in uh, in proteins. Don't need to know that. What you really need to know is tri means three. If you ride a tricycle, it's got three wheels. Well, adenosine triphosphate has one, two, three phosphates. And why that is important is. When it's got the three phosphates, when it's ATP, it is fully charged. When you need to use energy 
to run a race, to write with your pencil, to talk with your friends, to play a little game on your cell phone. Well, you got to use energy. And to, to use that, to release that energy, you turn ATP into ADP. Now, the only difference between these two guys, ATP had three phosphates, as you saw there on the left. ADP has one removed. It's got two. So, when the energy gets released from ATP, all that happens is one of those phosphates get plucked off from the ATP and it releases energy. Not really spelled that great, but it does release energy when that third phosphate gets released. Now, just like you don't throw away your cell phone at night just because your, your charge goes down to 0%, you don't throw away ADP either, because this thing can be recharged through cellular respiration. If you want to store energy, all you got to do is you eat food, and your mitochondria actually puts another phosphate onto the ADP to turn it back into ATP. Then it can be used once again to release its energy, and it all goes around and around and around. Alrighty, well this slide basically says the same stuff that I just said in the previous slide. So A, what happens when a cell needs to use energy? Well that is when ATP, with its three phosphates, one of those phosphate groups is broken off to, to make ADP. And when that happens, energy is released that your cells can use. So to release energy, you rip off one of those yellow balls, one of those phosphates, forming ADP, and in the process you release energy. Well now, if you want to store energy again, just like you want to recharge your cell phone, well, what do you do? You have ADP with its two phosphates, two, well, we need to turn it back into ATP with its three phosphates. So what do you do? You add a phosphate group. You add another to make ADP back into ATP. And that is done through respiration, which will be later on in this unit. Uh, additional energy-rich molecules. The only one we're going to need to know for photosynthesis is this guy right here, NADPH. What does it stand for? Well, if you really want to know, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Do you need to know it? No. These guys we're going to be using in respiration. We'll learn about them later. But all you need to know, these guys, all three of these guys, NADH, FADH2, and NADPH, they all carry hydrogens. And more importantly, they carry high energy electrons. So that's all these guys do. The H here stands for that hydrogen. Same thing with H here on this NADPH. It's carrying hydrogen, but more importantly, all these guys do is they carry around electrons. And those electrons can be used to make energy. Sometimes they're used to make sugar. Sometimes they're used to make ATP. Just depends on if you're doing photosynthesis or respiration. We'll go over that later. All right, so photosynthesis, what is it? Well, it means putting together with light. And what are they actually putting together? Well, of course, glucose. That's what plants are making. They're putting together glucose using the energy from sunlight. So there's the, this basically the regular definition, the process by which autotrophs, like plants, use light to convert CO2 or carbon dioxide and water into a sugar called glucose. They use special molecules which are called pigments. Pigments are basically just molecules that either absorb some wavelengths of color and they reflect others. So if you look at your shirt right now, my shirt I'm wearing right now is gray. So it absorbs most colors, but it reflects gray. 
That's why my eyes can see it as gray. Chlorophyll is the main pigment we're going to need to know. Pretty much the only one we're going to need to know. Chlorophyll. It is what makes plants look green. Because chlorophyll is a photosynthetic pigment. That means it's a, it's a pigment which is used to make glucose from sunlight. It absorbs most wavelengths of light, but it does not absorb green. It reflects green. Therefore, that is why plants look green, because they reflect green. Three other pigments that I don't know if I'm going to ask you about, ask you about them or not, but carotene, that's where carrots get their name. Plants have a pigment called carotene. That's what makes some plants look orangish. Phycobilins make some leaves in plants, like especially maple leaves, make them look red. And uh, xanthophylls makes the leaves of some plants look yellow. All these are involved in photosynthesis, but if you're going to remember any of them, remember Mr. Chlorophyll. That is the main one. The pigment involved in photosynthesis that allows plants to make glucose. These are just like some, some other ones, but they're not quite as important as Mr. Chlorophyll. And here's just basically a picture that shows why plants look green. This right here would be a chloroplast. And this is the sunlight coming in. And this is green light coming in. Well, as you can see, only 8% of that green light gets absorbed. 92% of it gets reflected. And that's why plants look green. So if, if you wanted to grow plants and you want them to grow really terrible, give them just green light because they will reflect most of that green light and plants won't be able to make glucose. Plants will not grow well under, under green light. This is kind of the opposite of the green. If you want plants to grow well, well, one wavelength of light that you can give them is red. Because unlike where green only 8% gets absorbed, when it's red, 64% gets absorbed. So this plant is absorbing more light, therefore it can make more glucose, more sugar under red light because it happens a lot better. Plants are able to absorb red light, but they reflect green and they also reflect yellow. All right, so here is the summary equation for photosynthesis right here. If you don't know it, hey, get to know it. This unit will not take that long, so get to know it fast. So, what do plants need to make sugar? They need carbon dioxide, and specifically they need six of them. They need water, or H2O. They also need six of those. The products that gets produced, glucose, C6H12O6, and as a waste product, plants release oxygen, into the atmosphere. Now what's kind of nice about this is they're all sixes. So that makes it a little bit easier to remember because we've got six CO2s, six H2Os, we make only one glucose and we release six oxygen. So it's six, six, and six. Now the things that go into a chemical reaction, those are called reactants. And the things that get produced or made in a chemical reaction, those are the products. So, in this equation, 6CO2 plus 6H2O plus light gives you glucose plus 6O2. Now the question is, why do we need six CO2s and six waters? Why don't we just have one? Well, if you look, Mr. Glucose here is C6. Glucose needs six carbons in order to be glucose. It needs six. It doesn't need one. That's why we need six CO2s in order to make our glucose, which has six carbons. We also need 12, a lot of hydrogens. One water molecule would not give us enough hydrogens, but 
6 times 2 equals 12. So that's why it takes 6 carbon dioxides and 6 waters to make our glucose molecules. All right, once again, kind of what we talked about in just the previous slide. Where did the six carbon atoms in glucose come from? Those are these guys, the six carbon atoms. Well, of course, those guys came from the six CO2. Where did the 12 hydrogens come from? That are also, here's the 12 hydrogens. Where did those come from? Those guys came right here from the six water molecules. That's how we got them, because these guys turned in to glucose. The six oxygen came from? It came from the CO2. You don't need to know it, but the oxygen does come from the CO2, not the water, because the water is used, it gets split, and that's where oxygen gas, O2, gets released. And that's where this is right there. There's the oxygen gas. It comes from the water. What are the reactants for photosynthesis? Well, that's basically everything up above that's in red. What are the products of photosynthesis? Well, those are the things that are in blue. And what's the energy source for photosynthesis? Obviously, that comes from light. All right, so some key terms associated with photosynthesis, some structures that are involved. Obviously, we should know, we should have heard of Mr. Chloroplast. Those are the organelles is where, where photosynthesis takes place. Uh, inside of the chloroplast are these little green disks. So they look something like this, little green disks. Dee, 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 dee. Like that. Each little green disc is called a thylakoid. Now they're green, of course, because they contain the pigment chlorophyll, which is within, within inside chloroplasts. A grana right here, all that it is, it's kind of the same thing as a thylakoid. The only difference is, instead of it just being one disc, like a thylakoid, a grana is a stack of thylakoids, a stack of green discs. So it's like a stack of green pancakes. That makes a grana. Grana is plural. If it's a granum, that means one stack. Grana would be plural, so it'd be multiple stacks. So it'd be like there's two stacks. And a stroma is just everything inside the chloroplast that is not a thylakoid or a grana. So the gel-like fluid between the grana or between the stacks of green pancakes, that's called the stroma. So within the chloroplast, we have green discs, thylakoids, stacks of green discs, stacks of thylakoids called the grana, and everything outside those stacks is called the stroma. All right, last one, folks. Once again, here it is. I don't know why this is yellow, but oh well. This whole yellow oval, that is the chloroplast. This is the, this whole thing around the outside, this whole thing is the chloroplast. Right here, one of these green discs, like that one on top, or maybe this one right here on the bottom, just one little green disc, that's called a thylakoid. Thylakoid. And when you have a whole stack of thylakoids or a whole stack of green discs, that's called grana. And everything outside, the fluid outside of these green discs, so this little fluid out here, We'll just put a little bloop, put a little blue like it's water. A lot of water in there. That's called the stroma.